Welcome to our course on project management. My name is Bill Bowen and I'm a project management instructor here in Ottawa, Canada. In this video, I'm going to examine some of the financial formulas and models that can be used to justify initiating a project. Let's begin by first asking the question, at what point in the project's life cycle would you need to justify a project? Project cost justification usually occurs prior to the project being initiated. Often companies cannot afford to pursue all projects. They need to prioritize and rank their projects to determine which ones are the most advantageous to proceed with. Let's take a look at what this process might look like. Clearly, a project begins by someone having an idea and recognizing that a need or a gap in capabilities exist within the organization. When a project proposal for how to fill that need or close that gap is prepared, then they have started on the path to creating a project. The part that we are interested in, in this video is how do you justify expending time, money, and energy on a project? Project justification is usually done through a business case analysis. A business case looks at the cost benefits of a project to the organization. Clearly, an organization would only approve a project that brings value or benefit to it. In this video, we will be looking primarily at projects that have a quantifiable financial cost and benefit to the company. Our goal is to understand how the formulas and models involved in this type of financial analysis works. So let's get started. The first concept that we need to understand is that of the break-even point. While there are a number of different perspectives and different formulas for calculating the break-even point, one of the easiest ways to think of it is as the number of units that need to be produced and sold before the revenue that is generated by the sale of those units equals the initial investment. Let's look at a practical example of the break-even point. Suppose a restaurant is considering buying a pizza oven and expanding their menu to include pizza. If the oven cost $5,000 and the profit per pizza was $5, how many pizzas would they have to sell before they recoup their investment in the oven? In this case, the break-even point is achieved when they sell enough pizzas to generate enough profit to equal the purchase of the oven. Reviewing the on-screen calculations show that they would have to sell a thousand pizzas before they would recoup what they spent on the oven. So the break-even point in this case is achieved when they sell 1,000 pizzas. The idea is fairly simple, but you can see how it could be used in developing a cost-benefit analysis business case for the purchase of a pizza. Now let's look at a similar formula, but one that is used to determine how long it will take to hit the break-even point, as opposed to how many units would it need to be sold. This formula is called the payback period, and it's equal to the initial investment divided by the cash flow over a period of time. So how does this one work? Let's assume you are considering insulating your attic as a project, but you want to know if it's worth it. You figure that it would take about $1,000 to purchase all the materials needed to insulate your attic. And you figure that you would save about $150 a year in heating costs. How long would it take for you to recoup your investment? This is where payback period formula comes into play. The initial investment divided by the yearly savings shows that we would recoup our investment in about 6.6 .6 years. You can see how the break-even point formula could be combined with the payback period formula to give a very clear picture of the project's cost-benefit information. So let's look at another formula, the return on investment formula. This formula returns a rate of return as a percentage on an investment. It is the anticipated profit divided by the initial investment. Let's look at a practical example. Suppose you were considering earning some extra money doing house flipping. This is where you buy a rundown house, fix it up, and sell it for, hopefully, more money than you purchased it for. In this scenario, you want to buy a $75,000 house, do about $35,000 worth of repairs and upgrades to it, and then sell it for $140,000. So what would be the return on investment on a project of this nature? Using the return on investment formula, we would divide our profit by our investment. In this scenario, we find out that we would make a return of about 27% on our investment. By knowing the return on investment for several different projects, you can then rank them based on which one would have the higher return on investment. You can start to see how these formulas would allow us to compare different projects and identify the most financially advantageous of them. Let's introduce a few more of these concepts that will allow us to understand even more formulas. Next, we will look at the concept of present and future value of money. 
All of us who have ever had a bank account understand that given interest rates, our money will grow over time. So how much would $1,000 grow over a three-year period if it was invested at 5%? There are two approaches to this scenario, simple interest and compound interest. Let's look at both. Using simple interest formulas, we withdraw the interest each year and it is only our initial investment that continues to earn interest in future years. Thus, we would take out the 5% interest that we earn each year, which is about $50 for each of the three years. So in the end, we end up with our initial investment of $1,000 back, plus $150 in interest. You can see how this works with the formula. Compound interest uses a different formula, because in this scenario, instead of withdrawing the interest each period, we leave it in place, so it earns interest in future periods as well. Therefore, the formula is a little different, but not too much. You can see in the slides I've laid out the formula and I've done the calculations for the same thousand dollars over the three-year period but this time using compound interest. The end result is that we earn fifty seven dollars and sixty three cents more than we would have earned with simple interest. Both simple interest and compound interest allows us to determine the future value of money that we would invest today. Now let's look at a formula that will allow us to determine the present value of a future payment. This formula is frequently used as the basis for business case cost analysis. The formula allows you to answer the question, how much would a future payment be worth in today's dollars after you've corrected for factors such as inflation? So in the future, do you think this same amount of money would be worth more or less than it is today? Historically speaking, the same amount of money would be worth less in the future than it is today. The whole concept behind this is that the purchasing power of money diminishes over time. In this graph, you can see that the buying power of the US dollar has continually deteriorated over the past 100 years. Let's look at an example of this formula. Suppose inflation was running at 5%, and somebody offered to give you either $990 today or $1,100 in three years from now. Which would you pick? if we assume that you simply wanted to maximize the money's buying power. To solve this, we need to understand the present value of money. This slide shows the formula for converting future value of money into today's dollars. We can see that the $1,100 that we would get three years from now would have the buying power of only $950 in today's dollars. So the best option would be option A. Take the $980 today instead of waiting three years for the $1,100. Let's look at how this formula can help justify a project. The idea of translating future value of money into today's dollars is the foundation of net present value calculations. Most projects need cash today in order to generate money at some point in the future. It can be difficult to determine if that future money is worth spending today's dollars on to get. Let's examine an example where net present value would allow us to determine if we're better off investing in a project or simply investing our money in some alternative option. For this scenario, let's return to our pizza oven example. Suppose we could buy a pizza oven for $8,320, but it would only last for four years, at which point we could sell it for about $900. We could also project how much additional profit we could make each year based on the pizzas that we could make in that oven. The owner is interested in the project, but only if it would make them a rate of return of 18%. Based on this information, would they be interested in the project? For these type of problems, we can use a formula called the net present value of money. Earlier in the presentation, we introduced the present value of money formula. This formula allowed us to translate future values of money into today's dollars. Having everything in today's dollars is important as it allows us to compare the purchasing value of the various cash flows. Rather than being shown as a sequence of calculations, the net present value formula is usually shown this way. It's the initial investment plus the summation of the present value of all the various cash flows. So let's see this formula in action. This slide shows the result of applying the present value formula to each of the projected cash flows. What is shown is that the pizza oven project would result in a positive cash flow that is above the 18% required rate of return. Therefore, based on these calculations, this project should be approved. Let's take a look at one more financial modeling concept, and that's the weighted score model. The weighted score model allows us to compare multiple projects based on how much value we put into the various comparison criteria. 
So if we have three comparison criteria and we do not value them equally, we can assign them weights. So how does that work? Supposing we have three projects and we can only fund one of them. We want to know which is the best project to fund. So we need to create some evaluation criteria. Here I've added some evaluation criteria. This criteria would probably change depending on the organization. And I could well imagine some organizations having more than just three criteria. But even so, it demonstrates the idea. Now I've added some weights to each of the criteria. These weights represent how important each of the criteria is to the overall organization. You should ensure that the various weights always sum up to 100. Having added the weights, you can now assess each project based on these criteria. We can assume that the organization has some quantifiable and measurable ways to evaluate each of the projects based on the listed criteria. Having selected the criteria, specified the weights, and evaluated the various scores for each of the projects, the only thing left to do is calculate the weighted score for each of the project and see which one comes in the highest. To calculate the weighted score, simply take each criteria's weight and multiply it by the project's criteria score. Then sum up the project's weighted scores to get the project's overall weighted score. You can see that I've done the math for project A on screen. Project B and C would use a similar approach. What we see is that based on each of the project's individual scores, once adjusted using our weighted score model, project A has emerged as the most preferable project as it has the highest score. So based on our weighted score model, well, that would be the project that would be selected. That was a real quick introduction to financial model. We covered a lot of material in this video and hopefully it was helpful. Keep in mind that these financial models are not unique to project management. You will find considerable supplementary information on them within both the course material and the information that you can find online using an internet search. That is all for this video. I hope it's been helpful.